online seminar. I hope you are all safe and well. Thank you as well to Stop the War for organizing this important meeting to all of our excellent speakers. You know, when thinking about this important campaign for a global ceasefire, I was actually reflecting on the fact that during the COVID-19 pandemic, there has actually been a tendency for world leaders to adopt uh, military language. We've seen the French uh, President Emmanuel Macron repeatedly declare that we are at war. Donald Trump calls himself a wartime president. Boris Johnson has talked of fighting a second battle of Britain. So at a time of unprecedented societal upheaval and collective national effort, I suppose we can see, given their backgrounds, why they've uh, looked at war uh, like rhetoric and, and that it's become commonplace. So rather than transport us to an imagined past of common endeavor, you know, this language ought to remind us of the unimaginable suffering caused by present day conflicts across the world. On the 23rd of March 2020, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres appealed for a global ceasefire amid the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, in a powerful statement, he said, the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war. Dominic Raab actually pledged that the UK was back in the ceasefire on the 19th of April, but little action has been taken to achieve this. Stop the War Coalition has started a petition to encourage the British government to act on this call. There are currently thousands of British forces in at least 35 countries around the world, including 1,000 in Afghanistan and more than 1,000 in the Middle East, including in Iraq and Saudi Arabia. Their continued presence in these areas is only serving to prolong conflict and heighten tensions. The RAF and BAE systems are continuing to support the Saudi-led war on Ye Yemen. Last week alone, Saudi-led coalition launched 106 airstrikes. The Yemeni conflict, the worst humanitarian crisis of the modern era, it's shameful, shameful that Britain is complicit in such an atrocity. The coronavirus outbreak offers our government a unique opportunity to step away from this conflict, as well as other theatres of war, which cause so much suffering across the globe. Stop the War is urging the government to draw up a plan to withdraw troops from war zones and reconsider its recent hike in the military budget. So I'm delighted that we're here to be able to discuss these issues and really put the pressure to get a global ceasefire. And I'm delighted that we've got a brilliant lineup of speakers. And to that end, I want to call on our first speaker. Our first speaker is a long standing writer and activist speaking out against war and military intervention in the Middle East. Since 2001, she has been active in various anti-war campaigns, not only in the US, but also as part of the global peace movement. She's a fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies and the co-founder of the US Campaign for, Palestine, uh, for Palestinian Rights, and also on the US Board of Jewish Voice for Peace. Our first speaker, can we uh, hear from Phyllis Bennis? Over to you, Phyllis. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you all. Uh, I always love working with the, the Stop the War Coalition in the UK. It's our counterpart in so many ways for the work that we've done together over the years. So it's great to be back with you, even though we have to be very virtual these days. Um, you know, the United States right now, despite the incredible drift towards right-wing nationalism that the Trump administration has put forward and, and encouraged, uh, remains a, a very global superpower, particularly militarily. There are still more than 800 U.S. military bases around the world. The U.S. still has troops and special forces of various sorts in over 149 countries around the world. Uh, the global war on terror is still raging, and of course it's doing very little to stop terrorism, but it's doing an awful lot to kill and injure and destroy people and countries all around the world. 
in that context, the United Nations call, the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire really should start with the United States. But unfortunately, we do not have either the rhetorical or the active uh, willingness to even take seriously such a call, let alone actually respond to it. The usual US responses have continued now, ignore the UN, condemn the UN, defund the United Nations, even while the US military budget continues to skyrocket. This year, it's over $748 billion that goes directly to the Pentagon, directly to weapons of mass destruction of all, of all types. You know, Martin Luther King taught us many years ago that budgets are moral documents. They expose the real moral priorities, in the case of my country, the immoral priorities of a country, of a nation. Uh, and in this time of crisis, what we really need is a recommitment, a renewed commitment to morality of budgets, morality of actions. Uh, what we're seeing, in fact, is precisely the opposite. We're seeing a budget where 53 cents out of every discretionary federal dollar goes directly to the Pentagon. More than half, 53 cents of every dollar. So because of that, we come into this crisis without having sufficiently funded for, for years, for generations. There have been cutbacks in public health spending, in education, all of which was aimed at being able to spend more on the military. And that's what we're now facing at this moment of emergency. The U.S. looks at this global crisis, this crisis that is such an example of the need for global collaboration, global cooperation to deal with this, with this pandemic, with this virus. And what's their response? They defund the World Health Organization just at the moment when the WHO is more necessary, more needed than ever. They cut the $400 million dollars that they were supposed to be paying to the WHO and add $10.5 billion. Imagine, $400 million is cut to the World Health Organization and they add $10.5 billion directly to the Pentagon in the last spending bill that was supposed to be the US response to the crisis to help the American people. So in the context of military spending, of course, $10 billion one way or the other is really very little when you're spending $748 billion for the military. $10 billion isn't so much. But if you compare it to what they are willing or not willing to spend on issues of emergency health care, of child care, of education, of all these things, it's a huge amount of money. It's an enormous amount of money. Uh, so this is the challenge that we now are facing. The challenge of militarism, the challenge to militarism, has to come both from the top, where we pressure governments, we pressure Congress, we pressure the White House to force them to reduce military spending. Other times we see that the challenge to militarism rises from the bottom. I think everyone in the UK has read the history, probably not so many people left who were around, but the history during World War I of the Christmas truce, where soldiers on both sides at a certain point early on in the war said, you know what, this is crazy. These people are poor young men, it was all men at that time, poor young men like us. And they came out of the trenches and, and played soccer in, in the, the open space between the trenches. And then they were sent back to war by their, by their officers. If that truce had continued, if the Christmas truce had con continued, Maybe Europe would not have been so destroyed as it was. Maybe those soldiers would not have gone home to, to spread the, the flu, the, what became known as the Spanish flu, but what was really spread through the, the context of the war. The pandemic of 1918 might have been prevented. So now what we see, particularly from my country, is the rise of new ways of destroying people's lives, even in the midst of this pandemic. So if we look at the countries that are under U.S. sanctions, what it means to be sanctioned by the United States, where trade is prohibited, nothing produced in the country can be sold, and the result is this dramatic impact on people's lives, insufficient food, medicine, the inability to get desperately needed medical equipment, 
in the United States, where there are unknown to most people in the United States, let alone in the rest of the world, there are 140 million people who are either poor, directly poor, or one paycheck away from poverty. Those 140 million people know what scarcity looks like. It's not scarcity of the kind we see in so much of the rest of the world, but it is a kind of scarcity nonetheless. And right now we're seeing that parts of the middle class for the first time are seeing the beginnings of what scarcity can look like, where things that they need, like access to ventilators in hospitals, suddenly are not available. But we also know in this country, the wealthiest country in the world, the wealthiest country in history, we know that these kinds of scarcities will end if we fight hard enough here. What people living under sanctions face is the uncertainty whether it will ever end. So like in the UK, like in the United States, if you look at hospitals, for example, in Venezuela, those hospitals are missing ventilators, masks, gowns, all of the equipment that they need. But unlike the United States or the UK, the hospitals in Venezuela, largely because of sanctions, are also missing clean water. They don't have enough soap. They're missing sufficient electricity. So the basics of being able to provide any kind of health care is unavailable. You see the same thing going on in Iran. The eight countries under U.S. sanctions, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, Zimbabwe, Syria, China, uh, North Korea, Russia, have all appealed to the United Nations to end sanctions in the context of the, of the coronavirus, just as the Secretary General has appealed for a, a ceasefire in that same context. The Secretary of State, Pompeo, has now admitted and said it's a good thing that conditions are so much worse for the Iranian people because now maybe they will rise up for regime change. This is deliberately designed to make people's lives much, much worse. And the U.S. at the same time is escalating those wars. They're sending US, two U.S. aircraft carrier groups off the coast of Iran directly to provoke Iran into a military confrontation, sending an armada towards Venezuela, right at the same time that sanctions are destroying people's lives in, in so many other ways. US drones are continuing to attack Somalia. AFRICOM has troops across Africa still making the situation far worse, not ending the terrorism that is their excuse, but making everything far worse for the lives of people there. What's needed is civilian public health officials to be in charge of all these things that the military has. In the US, we have 50 major military hospitals across this country and clinics and a whole separate stockpile of ventilators. That shouldn't be under the control of the military. That belongs to the people of this country who have paid taxes. And it's our government that should reclaim that and say those materials, those resources should be given to the public health officials, the civilian officials, not, the, uh, not the, the, the Pentagon to decide what their priorities are. We know from Dr. King when he said, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And we also know that today we're approaching physical death because of climate change, as well as people's death human death because of the, of the virus. So we need to fight for more militarized, sorry, fight against militarization as we fight for more multilateralism and more internationalism from our movements, from our social movements, demand multilateralism from our governments. We need international coordination and less coordination on military force. We need to be fighting for health care in the context of the emergency and coordinating as we demand that our governments coordinate against the coronavirus, we need to be coordinating ourselves between our movements around the world to end the wars and the militarism. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, uh, insightful uh, response. That's uh, brilliant. It's brilliant to have such an international um, uh, set, of, a panel, really. Um, for those of you who have joined us, 
My name is Claudia Webb. I'm the Member of Parliament for Leicester East here in the UK. And we would have ordinarily held this event in Parliament, but we're here uh, holding this event online and we're learning uh, indeed to operate in an international way because we're able to join up with, uh, with a brilliant international panel. We're talking about Global Ceasefire, and this is an event that has been organized by Stop the War. And um, Stop the War is, of course, an organization that I support and that I want more parliamentarians to support in order that we get this global ceasefire that I think that they rightly call for. Our next speaker is Daniel Abona. Daniel is a National Assembly member with France Insoumise for Paris 17 constituency. Daniel has a long record of anti-war and anti-racist campaigning. Um, so over to you, Daniel. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this conversation. Very important. I'm um, presently at the National Assembly because we are discussing the response to the coronavirus epidemic. And uh, it's very timely to have this conversation with fellow anti-war uh, and, and internationalist activists because that's very much the, the, the message we are trying to have here in the National Assembly in Paris uh, that we are trying to to tell our government about the, the correct response uh, to what we are facing here, but what millions of people are now facing around the world. I wanted to uh, start with uh, the war rhetoric that has been used and misused by all the leaders, as uh, Claudia said in the introduction. And uh, it's very upsetting and outraging because this rhetoric is used actually to silence to silence critical analysis of what is going on and why is it happening and how it's happening. It's a way to silence um, protest and um, demands for uh, a true response to, to, to the situation. And I find it very uh, shameful, especially coming from the very leaders who have been waging wars around the world for decades, the very governments that are actually waging war on people around the world. And it's a way also to uh, misappropriate the, the trauma and the suffering of millions of people who've been undergoing um, the sanctions, we've been undergoing uh, war, actual war happening all around the world. It's a way to uh, misappropriating the trauma of, of wartime. And I think it's very important to uh, oppose that. Um, we are not uh, at war, we are facing a pandemic uh, and um, that situation that makes a lot of people, millions of people in the Western world, aware of uh, what uh, maybe uh, other people have been have been facing for 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 decades uh, due to epidemic in, in in lots of region in Africa in Asia, but also due to wars. Uh, it's it's very it's a very sensitive issue because everybody is feeling in their very um, in, in a very intimate way uh, what it can mean to be actually more. And um, this uh, moment is, is actually an opportunity to understand what it means uh, to have its freedom of the freedom of, of, of moving, freedom of, of, of speaking, which is restrained. Uh, and we have to use it uh, to, to um, spread the awareness and the need of uh, the ceasefire, a need of a change in global politics and how we face together because now we are all uh, realizing how um, sensitive the issue of, of health is, how uh, precarious uh, our very existence as a civilization is. And that's uh, why we need this debate, this conversation, and this very protest uh, against uh, the, the people who are actually waging war on, 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 on other people around the world. We're not at war, we're facing a pandemic and it's important to repeat it because what we know about it is that this virus does not have the intent to kill. It just is, it's a biological hazard, but it is, it's not purposely um, attacking people. Uh, it's happened 
it's happened um, and it's important also to understand why it happened, why the spread of this uh, virus is causing so much uh, damage because of deforestation, because of the way um, animals have been put uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in animal farms and, 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 and the, the, the condition in which uh, we organize uh, agriculture and all, all those things. And also because of climate change, that will uh, that means that we're going to face uh, more uh, situation like that. So, in this very situation, it's all the more important to point out uh, the the very way the world has been led, led uh, is is making the situation worse. It's been said that uh, millions that have been spent uh, on war rather than uh, strengthening the health services rather than providing the very people who are now fighting to to care for uh, people who are ill now uh, have, have no means to do that because of the choice, the, the political choice that has been made for decades uh, against the public services, against health services. Uh, so that those are the roots of the, 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 the reason why this uh, epidemic is so catastrophic for millions of people. So I think we have to to take the opportunity of the situation. Uh, it's a lot of challenges uh, for, uh, as I say, health workers who need uh, the support, uh, not just the applause, but the means, the money to, to keep fighting, to uh, cure and for researcher to cure, to find a cure, uh, treatments. So that means uh, spending. That means a lot of money to be spent in the right way. So this is a, an opportunity to realize how our uh, priority needs to, to change um, nationally and internationally because uh, we also realize that no one is immune to the spread of the virus. No one is protected uh, and no matter how high the wall are raised or built to prevent people from traveling, to uh, uh, reject migrant people, the virus will find its way. So we need this uh, global solidarity. We need to strengthen the uh, World um, Health Association rather than defund it. And, uh, and we also need to demand uh, our government to, to stop spending millions on uh, building weapons to kill people and spend it to, to, to build materials to fight and to care for, for millions of people. I think about uh, people in Syria, people in, in Iraq, mm -hmm. people uh, in Palestine that are not just facing uh, the, the coronavirus without the means to protect themselves, but they have been living under actual war and military attacks for decades now. Uh, and this is the very moment that we need just um, a, a moral upsurging, a, a, mor a moral um, uh, a world awareness of uh, the need to help uh, with 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 health collaboration, but also help in a in a geopolitical way, in a diplomatic way, for those very preventable uh, disaster, war, uh, destruction to happen again in other countries. So. Uh, to me, the message that we are we are we are uh, trying to 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 pass on here in France, and 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 I think it's so very important to have this uh, conversation with fellow. It's the moment to stand up. Um, by any means. Uh, we can grab on, even if we are really straining our own homes to to ask and demand for this uh, uh, global uh, ceasefire. It's it's a it's a it's not just a moral, but it's a vital uh, need for millions of people around the world, and um, it's the very moment to do that because we are at a point in in our our human history where. There's a need, and we realize there's a need to refocus uh, our priorities for um, giving money to people, uh, protect the planet, and not uh, deciding to keep going with the way the thing used to be. There shouldn't be um, going back to normal because normal was the problem. 
was the problem for the epidemic, the spread of the, 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 the epidemic, and uh, the problem for millions of people living in poverty, not just in, in, um, uh, in foreign country, in the, in the global south, but in the very Western world where um, uh, in France, we got uh, nine people, nine million people living in, in poverty when it's preventable. Uh, we, we have now the very essential workers, uh, the nurses, um, the, the garbage collectors, those people who have been looked upon, who have been um, uh, called names uh, by our very president who uh, plays himself as a war leader, uh, who were looking down on them and who um, now are regarded as essential and as they are because that's uh, because of the work of uh, rank and file uh, workers of normal people that we are able to to face this this situation so it's a it's a moment of uh, uh reckoning uh, if i may say so to, to to realize the value of uh, human life of human labor and um we need to uh, strengthen the campaign of uh, uh stop that stop wall is is doing in the uk and i think every anti-war activist uh is still uh uh, working around um, to demand right now that policies are implemented to rebuild the, the public sector, to rebuild the health sector, uh, to give money not to uh, billionaires who are profiting from death, uh, whether it's by selling weapons or uh, uh, by um, exploiting and, 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 and exploiting even more workers uh, in, in the in the factories and who are like uh, ripping the benefits of the of the of the crisis we have to demand that those people actually pay their taxes as they should uh, and we have to demand our our governments to uh, stop sanctions on on people like in, in iran like in cuba uh, when you think about uh, the way that cuban people cuban doctors have been so helpful to go uh, in, in another country, you, to go uh, in Italy when the entire European uh, Union left Italian people to die and you have Cuban worker who went there and who gave their knowledge, who shared the knowledge to try and fight against the epidemic. That's, that's um, all the more upsetting and out outraging that uh, we could keep going with all those uh, uh, unfair sanctions against the people uh, in, in those countries. So. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to take part in this conversation and be assured that here in France with La France Insoumise and with all uh, the anti-war uh, movement and, and the citizen uh, in, in France, we will keep fighting for that and we are still fighting uh, for this better world that we are at a crossroad, we could refocus our society to face the, the, the pandemic, to face climate change that is still going on and that will be getting worse. We know that. Uh, and so we have to uh, prevent this from happening. We have to adapt our societies that uh, to, to build a model that could people uh, health care care as a whole uh, before profit. And I think that's uh, the message that I wanted to, to pass on. And thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to to listen to those uh, very interesting uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. I mean, of course, uh, it just brings really to the fore that uh, this moment uh, it makes us realize, obviously, that war is so futile. It's a moment to actually for us to put planet and people before war and profit. I mean, these are, this is really the moment. I wanna bring us into our uh, final speaker. Our final speaker is Mayor Wakefield. Wakefield. Mayor has been working with Stop the War for several years, organizing campaigns, writing articles, and facilitating demonstrations against war. He has written Stop the War's latest pamphlet, a short history of Western intervention in Iran. Without further ado, can I move on to Maya? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, 
Firstly, I'd like to thank all the speakers um, on behalf of everyone at Stop the War. Um, it's a brilliant panel. It's great to have an international panel. It's one of the things that um, this lockdown has obviously given us the opportunity to do is to um, unite uh, international panels. Um, we've had a couple so far. We had uh, Media Benjamin um, over from Code Pink in the US and um, it's a fantastic opportunity and it's something that once this lockdown is over we mustn't forget. Um, it's something that we must um, continue to build. I know both speakers have already said it but um, continue to build on an international basis because these crises that we face are international crises and they are ones that can only be tackled by international action and I think um, that's something that's really important to bear in mind. Just to go back to uh, the start of the meeting and the title of the meeting and the theme, I wanted to read a tiny bit from uh, Antonio Guterres' statement. I thought um, it was an excellent statement and one that kind of came out of the blue to some degree. Um, uh, maybe we were caught on our heels, but even as an anti-war movement, we weren't necessarily calling instantly for a global ceasefire as maybe we should have been. I'm just going to read a tiny bit from uh, his, his statement that he um, released uh, probably about a month ago now. He says, the most vulnerable women and children, people with disabilities, the marginalised and, and the displaced pay the highest price. They are also at the highest risk of suffering, suffering devastating losses from COVID-19. Let's not forget that in war-ravaged countries, health systems have collapsed. Health professionals, already few in number, have often been targeted refugees and others displaced by violent conflict are doubly vulnerable. This, the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war. Um, I think that uh, last sentence is something, well, hopefully uh, as this campaign builds, as the momentum builds towards a global ceasefire, um, is hopefully a sentence that um, we might, you know, um, look back on and, or maybe might be printed on t-shirts and such such like the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war. I think it really um, is quite a cutting statement and really um, is a message that uh, we must uh, continue to promote. Some may say that the, the rhetoric of, uh, of that message is a bit lofty, a bit uh, aloof, but um, actually surprisingly it's been very effective so far. Um, the call has been endorsed by over a hundred countries and even um, the likes of President Duterte in the Philippines have um, um, taken action to um, call a ceasefire in their own country. Um, and um, there was uh, quite a strong war there raging between communist rebels and, and his um, quite brutal government. Uh, even the fact that that's been brought to, the, brought to an end by um, this call for a global ceasefire is in many ways quite remarkable. I think also there are two main reasons why it's been so effective. I think firstly, it's um, a very practical suggestion. Um, pandemics throughout history have um, been, have, well, a massive contributory factor, shall we say, to some of the pandemics throughout history has been the movement of large um, uh, masses of people, uh, namely soldiers, as uh, Phyllis alluded to, um, with what was known as the Spanish flu, uh, British troops um, who went to India um, ended up um, moving the, the virus or the flu as it was um, to India and caused huge amounts of deaths. And I think there are two uh, very recent examples of why as a practical suggestion, this is um, very, very necessary. Um, they both um, are warships. Um, the USS Theodore Roosevelt and the French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle. Both ships have had over a thousand cases of coronavirus, positive cases of coronavirus happen um, in the last month. Uh, the close proximity and close contact required for such military activity um, is a means of spreading uh, the virus at uh, an unprecedented rate. And in many ways, this uh, virus is a great leveler and actually the larger the military, the greater the danger uh, for spreading the virus because these huge ships uh, and uh, constant missions, aircraft, flights, um, actually make that close contact more and more likely and actually may result in more and more of the spreading of the virus. The second reason why um, 
this ceasefire has maybe struck a chord is because actually it's an easy escape route for um, some regimes or governments that are mired in um, sort of aimless bloody conflicts um, such as the uh, Saudi Arabian regime in Yemen. Um, it's just over a month and, until we, or oh, since, sorry, we marked um, five catastrophic years of that war in Yemen. Um, the country was one of the poorest in the world even before the war started. Um, healthcare services were poor even before the war. And at this current stage, they are in absolute crisis. The UN estimates that 51% of healthcare facilities um, are functioning in Yemen and that two thirds of the whole population, it's a large country, I can't remember exactly how many people, but two thirds of the population have no access at all to basic healthcare. Um, this is not wholly, but largely as a result of the Saudi bombardment of medical facilities and of hospitals that has taken place. And we must remember that the UK is uh, of central strategic importance to uh, this Saudi bombing campaign. Um, RAF personnel are embedded in almost every level of the Saudi Air Force. They train the pilots, they service the jets, and there's even um, Royal Air Force personnel in the command room, uh, as was recently or earlier in the year admitted to in Parliament. Um, Saudi Arabia, quite soon after the call for the ceasefire, um, appeared to support it. Um, then the week after, they were um, back to their worst and launching over 100 airstrikes in a week, which, um, well, it obviously leads many people to think that it's a media stunt that the Saudi Arabian government have got behind this call. But I also think um, they do realize that they're not making any progress in the war in Yemen. And it is a moment where, um, as internationalists, um, we can pressure our governments, um, and particularly in this country, um, the conservative government has been one of the strongest supporters in, in, on the globe, on the planet for this war. Um, and it's a moment where we can really um, call for our government to end that war or, or put pressure on their Saudi counterparts to end that war as soon as possible as it simply wouldn't be possible without the help of British personnel. Um, our government could start for, for a start by dropping their appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, the campaign against the arms trade brought a case against the government um, to end uh, arms sales to Saudi Arabia um, because of how they were being used in the war in Yemen and they were successful in that case um, but now our government feels uh, sees fit to be taking that case appealing that case to the Supreme Court and well if they're true truly um, backing a global ceasefire they should be dropping that case immediately um, Dominic Raab, our Foreign Secretary, our temporary Prime Minister, while um, Boris Johnson was in hospital um, with COVID-19, um, also appeared to back the UN calls for a ceasefire. But um, just this weekend, it's emerged that actually uh, Britain was um, flying RAF troops, were flown to Iraq um, and dropped, um, I'm not sure exactly how many, but they were dropping bombs in Iraq just last week for the first time in seven months. We've, told, we've been told that ISIS has been defeated. Um, but while Boris Johnson was on his deathbed, uh, on, sorry, not deathbed, apology, on his hospital bed, I should say, sorry, um, RAF, um, there was an RAF mission which flew over Iraq and um, dropped bombs on uh, ISIS militants. This is with no scrutiny no oversight and to be honest, no mandate. When uh, these strikes were happening, um, yes, they may have been voted through parliament maybe five or six years ago, but we were told this has come to an end and our government can't just be allowed to drop bombs at will um, with no, um, having to answer to no one. And there are uh, urgent questions that we need to be asking of our government in relation to those strikes. Um, our defence secretary then went on to say that uh, whatever steps are necessary to keep the government to keep our nation safe are necessary. But 
these are incredibly hollow words at a time when um, our nurses, our healthcare professionals and our key workers are lacking um, basic, or some, many, are lacking basic personal protective equipment in hospitals, yet we seem to be able to fly um, thousands of miles around the world using our jets to drop bombs on people. It really uh, smacks of a government that has very warped priorities and it definitely uh, we should be saying again that after 17 years of occupation in Iraq, after um, the start of this year when the Iraqi parliament called for all foreign troops to leave the country immediately, both American and British troops, that we should be leaving that country and that again if this government is um, really sincere in backing the global ceasefire that it should be withdrawing those troops immediately. Um, unfortunately the military establishment in Britain doesn't really appear to be sincere in their proposals um, for um, backing the ceasefire. Um, on Friday a, the former chief of staff of the British Army called for a 50% increase in military spending and I'll quote here um, to prove from America's perspective that Britain has the resources to make it a credible player on the world stage and a worthwhile ally. So um, we're in a situation, we're in a massive pandemic, a huge crisis and one of the former generals or a former general feels it necessary to demand a 50% increase in military budget is it's well it's quite astonishing to be honest um, and it also maybe smacks of a bit of panic within the military establishment um, in recent days we've also had calls for a return to military service um, for young people in this country that would be the first time I think it was maybe 1965 that military service was ended in Britain um, I'll just read a tiny quote from yesterday's Daily Mail a historian has called for military service to be reintroduced 60 years after it was abandoned to boost the public's understanding of defence as Britain's armed forces face an ex existential crisis. And I think they do really face an existential crisis. Um, and maybe militaries all, all around the world do face an existential crisis because we have a real crisis on our hands that is killing hundreds of thousands of people around the world and all of the guns, bombs and tanks that you could buy wouldn't be able to do a single thing about it. So I really do think it is causing um, an existential crisis for militaries all around the world. And um, I'll start drawing to an end now, but uh, there was the CIPRI report yesterday uh, on military spending, which showed that uh, military spending is at an all time high uh, since World War II. Um, and again, when you, it was very timely because when it came in the headlines on the radio and you're listening to the radio and well, I'm surprised it was on the radio, it was on the BBC World Service, which um, is well, one of the only decent radio stations. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling, but um, when you hear the deaths and you're hearing about uh, lockdowns, you're hearing about services not working and then you get to the end of the newsreel and you hear that, um, global military spending is at an all-time high. It's really a shock to the system, and I'm sure it's a shock to many people's system. And it's something that, well, we can make a direct call to say. We just slightly lost you there, Mayor. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm on Richard Branson's Virgin Media uh, internet. You just slightly lost, Mayor. We just oh. doing a... in the world in the size of the military budget. France is number five. The U.S. of course is once again number one and bigger than the next eight. So that's where all of our countries are. Maybe Meyer's back. Thanks. Um, I, think my, I think we have Maya back now. You just want to just conclude there, Maya? We lost you there. You froze. Oh, apologies. Um, I'm on Richard Branson's Virgin Media Internet, which is, <laughs> anyone in England may know uh, is very temperamental. Um, but I'll wrap up. 
I just a little bit on campaigning and stop the war and what we're doing. Um, well, mainly our campaigning at the moment is limited to the online sphere, um, but it's important that people are still having conversations with friends and family about these topics. I think it's a time when uh, this sort of cut war, not welfare argument really can cut through. Um, uh, to that end, we're going to be sending out um, cut war, not healthcare posters um, via our email tomorrow, which people might be able to print out to uh, display during the um, one minute um, clapping that we're having every Thursday. I think it's important to put that message out there just to be sharing our posts, sharing uh, meetings like this, which will be up later, um, sharing articles from our website and also signing our petition. We've got a, a petition that we set up uh, two weeks ago now um, calling for Boris Johnson and the Conservative government to really take action to back this global ceasefire and we hope um, that you guys will all go away and sign it and share it um, and yeah that'd be brilliant and also join Stop the War um, once we come out of this crisis um, we're going to need to be putting these arguments out on the street and we're going to need your support so if you're a member of Stop the War thank you and if you're not please um, join Stop the War and strengthen our movement thank you and thank you for that mayor that's was that was absolutely brilliant and insightful and really summarizes what stop the war is about really and about uh, why the why we need to argue for this global ceasefire do you just want to just say where people can actually um one get a, a recap of this seminar if they, if they want if they so choose will they be able to go go to the uh, facebook uh, site or the website to stop the war just want to say a bit more about how people can get involved and get engaged and put keep the pressure on of course um this meeting will be up on our facebook page for sure it'll be on our youtube channel which would also be posted to our website uh, we'll be sending it out in our newsletter tomorrow um, you can find us online, uh, Facebook, Twitter, at STWUK, Instagram is the same, um, there's many, many ways to get involved, um, and I'd encourage everyone to, um, if not joining as a member, just join our mailing list, uh, that's the best way to stay updated on our work. Thank you, thank you so much. We've got a few um, questions coming in now as well. Um, so perhaps if we can take some of those questions and open it up to the panel um, to respond. Um, and just a reminder for those who are, uh, are listening to us and watching us online, if you wanna ask a question, the time to do so is now. Um, and we'll try and get a response to as many questions as possible from wherever you're watching uh, across the globe. Uh, solidarity to you all. Um, and I'm really pleased that we are having this international uh, event and I can't thank Stop the War uh, enough really for organising this. But our first question um, says, uh, what response has, has there been uh, or has been received from UN member states to the Secretary General's call uh, for a ceasefire? Do we, do we have... Um, Anybody that wants to um, look at that? I mean, I think we've answered some of that during our presentations. I know that to, we know that the UK has signed up, but has done very little since. Um, so what, where are we with other countries? Any of the panelists? I would just mention one thing, which is, I think, maybe obvious to everyone on this call, which is that uh, the, the perpetuation of war, permanent war, has been so long a feature of U.S. foreign policy. It's been a foreign policy based on war and not diplomacy. That is not changing. There has been no serious response to the Secretary General's response, either rhetorically and certainly not in the real world. So the U.S. is continuing uh, military attacks. AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command, is carrying out attacks across Africa. The uh, the so-called global war on terror, primarily in the Middle East, uh, remains underway. There are still troops in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, in you know, involved in the in the air war. All of this is continuing in in Libya. So the the drone strikes against Somalia are continuing. So all of this is is continuing, and I'm afraid that because of the extraordinary dis uh, disproportionality of U.S. military power that as long as the U.S. continues 
its wars, uh, wars will continue. So the war in Afghanistan will not end when the U.S. makes its agreement with the Taliban. It may reduce the number of people being killed because it may mean that the U.S. troops and the U.S. planes are pulled out. So it's a good thing for there to be an agreement like that. But what the U.S. has put in place in Afghanistan ensures that the war will continue for some time to come. And I think that's true in, in so many countries around the world. I, I, I fear that that's probably uh, right. And I think that that's why we need to keep up the pressure. It's not good enough for uh, Dominic Raab to give an indication that he supports that, but then obviously um, we're seeing wars continue and the situation in Yemen is uh, dire, uh, to say the least. I want to thank Leslie Rickard for sending us that question. Um, so thank you for that. I have another question. It says, at a time when it has become increasingly clear Someone else is frozen again? We lost Claudia. If I may, in the meantime, maybe add something. Yeah, uh, um, someone here is. Um, someone here has asked. Um, Mayor, can I just add a little? Yeah, bit? yeah, yeah. On that question, yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, just to to add to what has been said, because if there have been any. Uh, response from France, um, the words were so empty that we are still looking for it because uh, obviously the um, Macron government is still aligning, uh, aligning to lost. NATO and the US. So um, Emmanuel Macron liked to do uh, big words, uh, big shows, but uh, at the end of the day, he will just obey to whatever uh, the US and Donald Trump will say with just mild um, little words to say, oh, not too harsh, but at the end of the day, he won't oppose it. So that's very, um, uh, that's very bad because there's no actual uh, leadership uh, for peace and uh, to end sanctions, for instance, uh, against uh, Iran or uh, anything. And we're just like, um, even uh, within the EU, there's no actual uh, the fight to, to have take a more uh, uh, affirmative, uh, offensive stand against wars and uh, try to distance ourselves from the US uh, and the, 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 the warmongers in the, in the US or the, the EU. So that's, um, that's the case. That's the reason why we need people to actually act and protest and, and put pressure on our governments and not let them, because uh, at the end of the day, they, they still have the same frame, um, uh, state of mind, whether it's about economics or, or politics, they are still, they still be, they still have the idea that we are just to go back to normal, go back to the way the things used to be, which is, um, war and uh, predation against nature and, uh, um, economic war against uh, the people. Thank you. Thank you, um, Daniela. And I, I think I lost some of you there myself, but I'm, I'm back. Um, we've got um, a few more questions. Um, and I just want to thank the people who are asking questions in the chat room, um, which is really, really very good. And we've even had an offer of, of, a, of a poem as well. So maybe we can um, get that link um, in the in, in in somewhere on Stop the War website, um, or you can post that link in the chat room, and maybe we can all get access to that. So thank you for that and solidarity on that. And I've got another question which says: Does the current crisis does the current crisis make the case for scrapping Trident stronger than ever? And that question's from Colin Gray. So Maya, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah, of course. Um, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, again, like I said uh, earlier, um, there is no sort of weapon on earth that could uh, defeat this virus, which is causing hundreds of thousands of deaths. So why do we want a deterrent that 
may cause millions of deaths. Um, it really doesn't make sense. It's going to cost Britain uh, roughly two hundred billion pounds for the the new Trident missile program, um, which isn't an independent missile program by by any means. Um, and yeah, I think this crisis highlights um, the absurdity of those nuclear weapons and. We, it really is a time when we should be saying um, stop Trident and, and end the uh, nuclear missile weapons pro nuclear weapons program in Britain, definitely. Okay, brilliant. Um, anyone else wants to come in on that? Uh, oh, I think Phyllis wants to come in, but she's... Phyllis? There we go. I think I'm... Can I just add one quick point? Yes. You, just said. you know, the collaboration between the US and the UK on these issues of war and peace are so critical. I'm thinking back both to the efforts that we all made to build a movement against war in Iraq in 2003, which of course didn't stop that war, but it did set the stage for a global movement uh, for the first time, the, the movement of February 15th, 2003. But then if we go 10 years further, in 2013, when it was the decision of the British Parliament that set the stage for our movement, which had been struggling but not succeeding yet. We suddenly were able to succeed because the, the British Parliament, reflecting the views of the British people, mobilized by organizations like Stop the War Coalition, had voted against using military force uh, to engage against the government of Syria. And so the US, at the last minute, we were able to stop the possibility of a massive bombing campaign against Syria. Now we know it's never enough that in that occasion, a year later, the US did launch a bombing, a set of bombing raids against Syria. But for one year at least, we were able to prevent it. And it was because of that collaboration, that historic collaboration between the US and British anti-war forces, backed by global anti-war movements all around the world. So I think that that's something that we really need to keep in mind as we struggle to rebuild an anti-war component to this movement that is rising so powerfully around the question of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. That's brilliant. We've got um, a, a few more offerings in our, in our chat. Um, I want to thank uh, Emil for your offer of your song, um, which is available on YouTube, Bandcamp. Um, so I'll just give that a quick mention because you've offered it there. Um, and I think that um, also we've got a we've got a question um, which is which uh, quite a poignant question um, which is asking um, what pressure needs to be placed on the UK government and NATO ambassadors to stop attacks and reckon the and and the rec stop attacks and the recon reconnaissance top of stop attack and the re reconnaissance of any war zone by drones satellites and remotely controlled aircraft and that question came in from john doyle um so do we have a any panelists want to take that on danielle are you okay with that or yeah i can say a few words i think um all sorts of actions are needed and um, even if we are restricted in the way we can uh, protest uh, we have uh, email campaigns and um, putting banners and uh, um, contacting our representative to tell them to actually uh, oppose by every parliamentary ways and stuff but I think also one of the very important way of uh, action is actual by workers by strikes for instance I'm, i've been thinking about what um dock workers dockers did in france um a couple of months ago uh they uh, refused to uh, allow a ship who was uh uh, who had uh, weapons to go to the Middle East uh, and they said we don't want to accept this ship uh, in our harbor and uh, and they 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 actually took action and they decided to 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 go on strike and I think that's um, 
in a time where we see how ordinary people are actually essential for the world to uh, keep going, uh, the, we have to take this power uh, and um, make everything possible for those workers to organize and to actually strike and stop everything and to say, no way, we won't send weapons, we won't make weapons. Uh, and I think that's also um, a, a way of uh, showing solidarity to the people who, are, will, be, who will suffer uh, under the bombs and um, the military attacks. And um, yeah, that's uh, an example, I think, of the way we could all take part in um, uh, anti-war protests and actions. You know, one Thank other you. aspect that I think can be useful in, in, in that as we're looking for ways of building movements in this very difficult time is making the link beyond the anti-war movement that defines itself that way for all of the other movements, the movements against racism, the movements for climate justice, the movements for immigrant rights, all the various movements that are in motion right now focused on what we need to survive this pandemic. One of the demands for all of them should be cut the military budget so that we have money to deal with the pandemic in a human way. You know, and, and it's something that I think for too long our movements have often focused on building our own organizations, you know. And in, it's certainly true in the US that I think we did that for too long. And we, we delayed what was needed to get that information into the hands of the leaders and the activists on the ground in all these other grassroots movements on so many other issues. Because at the end of the day, if half of the available budget is going to the military, you're never going to be able to pay for a Green New Deal and free college education and health care for all. You've got to find the money, and the place where the money is, is the military budget. So we should be urging all of our comrades in the other movements to take on the demand to cut the military budget at the same time. That's um, that, and that, that is really important. And if we can do that across um, every country, every significant country, country across the world, it would be powerful, and not least in the UK. And if Stop the War haven't yet already um, coordinated a letter so that we can get some cross-party support, really, to put pressure uh, uh, on government, then I think we should uh, try to do that if that hasn't happened already. Uh, and I don't know, Maya, if you can uh, give us an indication on that, but I think that uh, this is the moment really to kind of build that cross-party support to get the UK government to, um, to change the way in which it, it spends money on defence. Definitely. Um, at the moment, we've got a petition. Um, we've had thousands of signatures on the petition um, calling for people to... Um, pressure our government to join the global ceasefire but I think that demand that Phyllis says of um, significant making significant cuts to uh, military budget um, is something that is central to our campaign and something that definitely we should organize uh, a letter or similar and put that right at the forefront of our messaging going forward because I really think it's a time when that messaging is going to connect with people um, why are we spending, uh, say for instance, in this country, our military budget is going up by around three billion pounds uh, this year. That, that was announced just prior to the crisis. We should be demanding that that increase is stopped immediately. Um, that money that was going to that increase should be directly channeled into our healthcare services or into our social care services, um, where it would be far more useful and would have far, uh, far more positive effect on people's everyday lives then money that is going to be spent on aircraft carriers that actually might spread uh, the virus but also spread misery and uh, destruction for people around the world so i think that's something that definitely uh, will continue to be central to our campaign thank you and uh, certainly uh, those of us in parliament um that are are supportive of this and want social solidarity with this with this we will certainly uh, work hard to support you in that um, you. I've got a um, I want to just say that in the chat room I'm pleased to see that uh, Birmingham stand up uh, Birmingham stop the war campaign comrades are going to take placards um, on uh, this Thursday so I hope that other colleagues across the UK will join them at the NHS uh, clapping session at 8pm on Thursday and uh, the placards will simply say uh, cut war 
uh, not healthcare. I mean, I think that's a brilliant message if we can um, get those placards and join in with the, the NHS uh, clapping session, because if we can, um, uh, the biggest thing that we can do, I think, to support our NHS is to ensure that we have the investment that they need going forward. And we certainly need to transfer that investment from the spend on defence into spend on our NHS and valuing our NHS much more and ensuring that in course, that of course, our social care workers and health care workers have all the resources, including PPE and testing that they need. And um, the transfer of funds in that way would be important. So an important message and action really, in terms of what we can do individually and collectively with those placards on a Thursday at 8 p.m. Um, I ask you all to draw down on those and participate. So we are coming now to the close of our session. Um, I'm just looking for one or two other questions. Um, um, but so in the absence of uh, other questions, there is one more question I can see. Do we, I don't know if, um, if Maya is still on, on the call, but there's a question here is, do you yeah. recommend any reading documentaries, reading or documentaries? Um, and there's a question about reports on uh, BAE systems, but, but Maya, any, any um, reading material or documentaries you recommend? Yeah, uh, there's one that comes to mind. Uh, I have a uh, watched it myself but I'm planning to in the next couple of days and I have been recommended it by several people. It's a film called War School. Um, it's about how the British Army, uh, funded by um, some of the larger arms companies, um, actively try to recruit in our schools um, through cadets and other means. Um, as I say I haven't seen it but it definitely goes into a lot of depth and it has um, representatives from Veterans for Peace and other similar organisations and it's a very in-depth documentary about how um, I guess the wider military and the industrial complex uh, attempts to uh, indoctrinate um, children from a young age and how they can uh, shape the young minds into um, believing that the military is something that is positive for them rather than something that uh, is actually a destructive force in our society so yeah that's one. war school it's up on youtube now as of brilliant. yesterday brilliant if we if we can if we can post the link to that in in the um, chat somehow that would be absolutely fantastic another um um audience member wants to remind us that uh, that that the that the pope also um, agreed with the call for a uh, global uh, ceasefire so um, I think we should uh, we should acknowledge that and and, and, and and accept that so this sort of brings us to the close of our but before we close uh, some closing remarks um, I don't know if we can have some closing remarks um, maybe um, if I start with you Phyllis um, um, and then May, if you want to say one or two words, and then I'll just make some closing remarks too. Sure. Thanks, Claudia. And thanks to all of you for sticking with us through this discussion. It's been a fascinating one. I think there are a bunch more questions in the Q&A part that we probably uh. have time to get to, but um, I appreciate everybody being on. I would just urge that we continue the work as, as hard as it sometimes is to build a global movement that recognizes that the struggle against war, the struggle for justice has everything to do with military spending, has everything to do with how we conceive of the role of military in our countries and what should not be the role of the militaries in our countries. And we have a huge amount of work left to do. This is a really challenging moment. And being able to have this kind of interaction is what makes it all possible. And Hopefully we'll be able to continue building these collaborations because at the end of the day, what governments do is important. That's where power lies, but the power is determined from below. The power is determined at the grassroots, how we pressure our governments, how we make our governments do the right thing when they don't want to. 
because they represent so much of the bad stuff. So I think that's what we need to really focus on. And I'm looking forward to the continued collaboration. Thank you all. Uh, and Phyllis, you, you, you've rightly pointed me to the, to the, the, that there are some more questions. So if you've just got a moment, we can probably just um, um, tackle one or two of those that have been directed particularly at you, um, Phyllis. I've got a question here from Jan Burgess, um, who asked the military uh, industrial complex has totally infiltrated the US administration. Those of us who've been campaigning for a very long time to see no end, uh, see how they've destabilized all the African countries they've sent troops to. And while we're here speaking about ceasefire, are gearing up globally for what may be nuclear option. How do we deal with this? Will getting rid of, of, uh, uh, of, of Trump make a difference? Oh, big questions. Um, the, the last question first, will getting rid of Trump make a difference? Yes. Okay. Will it end warmongering in the United States? No. Trump represents a very particular and horrifyingly powerful right-wing tendency in the United States that goes far beyond the warmongering that he has escalated. As we all know, this war did not start with Trump. It didn't start with Obama. It was continued through Obama's period. It didn't start with George Bush. It was massively escalated by George Bush. But these are trajectories within US foreign policy that have been there for a very long time. What's different about Trump and why it is so urgent to think about a, um, the need for changing this presidency is that he has not only continued the warmongering, but has empowered and enabled powerful right-wing movements within the United States that are now having a global impact that are rooted in racism, in misogyny, in, in xenophobia, in Islamophobia, and that these tendencies have been given, they're, they're not new in US history either. There have always been, since the history of our country was rooted in slavery and genocide, genocide against the indigenous population, slavery of, against Africans who were brought in chains to work as slaves in the United States. That's what made the United States so wealthy and so powerful. In that context, it's always been a feature of our country. We have also though, and this is what the great historian Howard Zinn has taught us, that aside from understanding that history, the history of genocide and slavery, there have always been movements against genocide and slavery. And they didn't always win, but they always kept fighting. And Trump has made it harder for those movements to keep fighting. So that's one of the, the real differences. The broader question, how do we fight back against the military industrial complex? I think it starts by recognizing that they are not, I would say, infiltrating the government. That implies that somehow the government exists separate from them. The government right now, including far too many members of Congress in both parties, are in bed with the military industrial complex because they are paid by the military industrial complex, which provides huge amounts of money to congressional campaigns, Senate campaigns, presidential campaigns, and campaigns at the state and local level as well. So that's what we are struggling with. You know, somebody like Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, who is making a killing right now as everyone starts using Amazon to have things delivered, the richest man in the world, he could pay the WHO budget for 10 years by himself and still have $114 billion left over. So the question of giant corporations, now he's not one of the ones funding the military, but his colleagues in that upper one-tenth of 1%, one the CEOs and the, and the others of these military corporations are putting money into making sure that people accountable to them win elections. We have to counter that, not with money because we don't have it, but with people power. At the end of the day, they're putting in that money to buy votes. We have to make sure that they don't get those votes that they are trying to buy. It's not easy and it's not enough. Elections in our country are not our turf. They're not our people. But we have to make clear that 
at the, at the end of the day, those in power matter a great deal. There was a famous statement, I think, from, from, from uh, a folk singer, Pete Seeger, many years ago, who said that when you're talking about the bad guys, the last half inch can be the determination between life and death. If you're drowning and the water's up over your mouth, that last half inch to your nose is life and death. And for the people at the bottom rungs of the economic ladder of our country, the poorest people, the most vulnerable, the people of color, the immigrants, these are the people at the bottom of that hierarchy. And they are the ones for whom that last bit matters. So that when it's even an election between bad and worse, it's important to vote for the bad guy because the worse is worse for the people at the bottom. And it matters that last half inch between life and death. Is that the answer? Of course not. But what a great activist said recently is that she was being asked about, would you vote for somebody like, like Joe Biden who has supported so many wars? She said, Joe Biden is not my candidate. I don't share principles with him. I don't share policies with him. But of the two, if it's a choice between those two, she said, I, I don't take positions on, on elections in a public way because I work for a nonprofit organization, but I'm just reporting what she said. She said, of those two, I would choose Biden to be my, em, my enemy for the next four years. I would choose him to be who we are going to be protesting for the next four years because it's less dangerous for people at the bottom. And that's what elections mean. Defeating Trump is necessary, but not sufficient to change our country and to end wars, to end racism. All of those challenges are massive. Changing one president is not going to do it, but we can't do it without doing that as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. And just uh, as we, Maya, as we, as you close your remarks, I'm just going to combine a a, a couple of que questions. One from Gavin Seeley, which really just summarizes how can we raise the consciousness of uh, people in the West? And I uh, just want you to combine that with um, a question which is really asking, would the would stop the war um, consider um, would stop the war consider a a ceasefire? without the withdrawal of troops? Uh, that that makes sense. Second one. And that, that, that was from Adele uh, Gear. So basically Adele Gear is saying that the UN are calling for a cease, ceasefire, would stop the war, consider a petition for support for a ceasefire only rather than withdrawing troops, uh, which, which um, she indicates is a big step in military terms, a retreat. Um, no, I tend to think not. Obviously, Stop the War is a democratic body with an officers group and a steering committee, and I can't speak for everyone that's and involved in Stop the War by any means. Um, but I'd say primarily we, we have always called for withdrawal of those troops. Um, having been an occupying force in Afghanistan now for 20 years or almost 20 years and in Iraq for 17 years. Um, what does a ceasefire really represent if, if, if you still have thousands of troops, uh, unwelcome troops, troops that are wanted by the government, um, stationed in bases all around, uh, around the country? Um, in many ways, well, to me anyway, that wouldn't represent, um, a ceasefire. Obviously, we'd love to see a ceasefire first, um, but I think it's uh, very, very important that we end the occupation of, of those two countries in particular. Um, as for the second question on spreading consciousness, um, Stop the War have a series of upcoming meetings. We have a meeting, very important meeting on Julian Assange coming up, um, where his father will be speaking. We've got a representative from the WikiLeaks and Julian Assange's legal team, uh, John Rees from Stop the War and a, a journalist or um, journalist and member of the National Union of Journalists. Um, and then we're, a few weeks later, we're going to be joined by the world famous, uh, one of my heroes, uh, John Pilger, um, 
whose last two films, The Coming War and the NHS, and the or, no, sorry, The Dirty War and the NHS and The Coming War on China, um, those two films must make him um, one of the best people on the planet to be able to analyze this current situation. Um, and we're very excited about that one. So I'd say um, if you want to spread some consciousness at this particular moment, um, send those links out to your friends, encourage them to join our mailing list and um, yeah, well, be part of this um, movement uh, for a growing and burgeoning international movement that um, will hopefully come off the back of this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. And thank you for being uh, so uh, insightful in organising and coordinating this event uh, for us here. I just want to bring uh, Daniel in for some closing remarks. But Daniel, we have a, a, a question which, which you can pick up in your closing remarks. It's a question that, uh, that I have to ask myself as well. But really, uh, being from an opposition uh, party, um, how effective can anti an anti-war movement be when uh, you're outnumbered uh, by uh, Macron's party? Yeah, um, quickly, um, also regarding what Phyllis Venice said, um, I think we're in a very um, uh, crucial time. And obviously, what's going to happen in the next month, especially in the US, in the next November, is going to be important in many ways. Uh, it, I, I was reflecting on the debate in France around um, elections, around uh, uh, voting for the less necessarily evil, because we've been faced with those debates before. We may be faced with this debate again. Um, and um, I don't know, uh, I think it's, it's uh, about everybody in their very, I mean, conscious to, to decide. And I, I, I think whatever uh, you decide to vote, uh, it's, you go vote and, and, and express um, your, uh, your fear or your anger or your hope in that vote. It's very important. I'm an elected official. That's my first time being elected. And I'm from an opposition party, minority party. And uh, uh, it, all, it sometimes feels very uh, overpowering because we're in the minority uh, in the House and uh, they've just voted uh, um, uh, in favor of the government's uh, response, which is uh, below whatever it should be. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think that um, what people have been experiencing over the past uh, weeks and months is really raising consciousness by itself. It's not just the, the, the political rhetorics or, mm. you know, the, it's, it's the very experience of life and death. Uh, and that makes people aware of a lot of things. And I think um, on the one end, uh, I don't know if it's a very clear response, but it's more reacting to what has been said. What I would say is that um, you need to get engaged. You need to, to be active. You need to, to protest. We need more. Uh, I need more uh, elected officials, uh, anti-war elected officials. Uh, I need more uh, Ilan Omar in the U.S. I need more... Uh, Ocasio-Cortez, I need more um, Jeremy Corbyn and, and the likes in, in the UK um, and the people need more of that. So um, go vote for the people you want to be on the ballot and make sure that there are anti-war activists on the ballot. And I would say that, I would say, um, don't think about, I mean, the, the, we need to defeat Trump and the likes um, by voting against them, but also by voting people who will be uh, in position, uh, we will have the, the 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 space in the in the audience to speak up against war, and it's been so inspiring to hear about the the, the Bernie Sanders campaign, and 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 even though he suspended it, I think it's 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 uh, it's done wonders around the world to hear people leaders in the U.S. having those anti-war stands. So so go go put the names on the ballots of people anti-war uh, people. And, and last, um, I mean, to me, what, that's what inspired me. <laughs> that's what inspired me to, 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 
to hear people uh, clapping for uh, health workers and also elf workers themselves. To me, I, I feel very in inspired and humbled because I think what has prevented us from collapsing is actually people mobilizing, elf workers mobilizing with the, the, the few means they got left. Uh, and also um, people, ordinary people, uh, being very disciplined and actually, you know, uh, obeying the, the sanitary um, rules and that's what made it possible for the the, the spread of the, the virus diminishing so it's the people who actually had the best response to the to the to the epidemic it's not the government because they've been doing uh i mean shit actually they've been doing the the, the worst but the people had the good response so to me, the way forward is to empower that, to, to strengthen solidarity, day to, daily solidarity, uh, what we've been witnessing around neighbors, um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, helping workers organize and protest like the Amazon worker in France. We've, we've actually won a, a, a court battle a couple of days ago against Amazon because uh, Amazon worker uh, and, and trade unions actually go, went to court and saying we have to shut down those places because that's spreading the virus and we actually won and it was like very important. So support workers uh, fighting for their rights and um, and yeah, and that to me is what makes me uh, keep going. And and really, I do think that we are at a very important moment where um, the society as a whole can actually turn toward uh, better tomorrows if we actually keep the momentum of this extraordinary mobilization uh, that's been you know going on. If we uh, push forward and uh, yeah. Uh, if we actually uh, keep doing the good work that's I think all of us and all a lot of people, millions of people around the world have been doing. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't know if it's answering uh, very precisely, but that's actually what, uh, what I, I, I feel very, very deeply. And that's why I'm in a way optimistic about that mm -hmm. very uh, uh, dreadful period. But um, yeah, people well, realizing it's a very, uh, the, a source of strength and, and hope for, for the future. Well, thank you. And thank you for that, uh, your optimism, your passion, and indeed your hope uh, for all of us, because that will certainly inspire us. I just want to uh, close by, by giving some uh, closing remarks really on behalf of us all. You know, Britain has the sixth biggest defence budget in the world, set to reach 55 billion this year. Defence spending in the UK is the fourth largest area of government spending. And, you know, Stop the War's recent audit of British military activity has highlighted the obscene financial cost of war. Uh, it's starkly apparent and the redeployment of taxpayers' money towards tackling the COVID-19 crisis has actually never been more urgent and it's absolutely vital i know for instance in my own uh, area of 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 operation there are there are thousands of british citizens uh, stranded abroad due to transport uh, restrictions in my own constituency of leicester east alone i have been helping hundreds of residents who are stranded in remote locations across the world, primarily in India. And in a sense, you can imagine, therefore, how you could uh, redeploy uh, the use of RAF and military aircraft to actually shuttle British nationals who are actually locked down in remote parts of the world to the nearest appropriate international airport. That, of course, would be an unprecedented move, but it's an unprecedented move that would, should be un undertaken in the spirit of international solidarity. We are living in an unprecedented and through an unprecedented crisis. And unfortunately, of course, we have a government that has been unwilling thus far to engage the armed forces to bring our loved ones and family members home. This is just, I think, one way in which the military could be used in service of peace. From this pandemic to the existential threat of climate change, the global community is facing increasingly common enemies. Rather than appropriating the language of war, our governments should use this moment, this moment to end the intolerable suffering suffered by global conf conflicts.
Now is the time for a true global ceasefire. I want to thank Phyllis, I want to thank Danielle, and I want to thank uh, Maya, and I especially want to thank Stop the War for organizing and coordinating this event. And equally, I want to thank all of you, our audience members, that have participated, engaged from across the world in our uh, global ceasefire conversation. I hope our conversation continues. I hope our efforts continue. And I hope that we can be inspired to continue to demand our global ceasefire. So on that note, I want to uh, call our conversation tonight to a close. And I know that we will have many more conversations and that we will continue to support the efforts of Stop the War and other organizations in, in getting us towards a global ceasefire. And certainly we know that when we come out of this um, uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic, that our systems and way of life have to be different. And one of the differences that we can make is to end uh, the global wars that we're seeing across the world. Um, and we should be operating and working towards peace and ensuring that vital resources are spent in better ways. Thank you to everyone. Thank you and good night. Thank you all. Bye, thank you, bye. Bye. Okay, are you...